The Lurking Fear. Written by H.P. Lovecraft. Told to you by Edward E. French. What the red glare meant. On the tempest-wracked night of November 8, 1921, with a lantern which cast charnel shadows, I stood digging alone and idiotically in the grave of Jan Martens. I had begun to dig in the afternoon because a thunderstorm was brewing, and now that it was dark and the storm had burst above the maniacally thick foliage, I was glad. I believe that my mind was partly unhinged by events since August 5th, the demon shadow in the mansion, the general strain and disappointment, and the thing that occurred at the hamlet in an October storm. After that thing, I had dug a grave for one whose death I could not understand. I knew that others could not understand either. So I let them think Arthur Monroe had wandered away. They searched, but found nothing. The squatters might have understood, but I dared not frighten them more. I myself seemed strangely callous. That shock at the mansion had done something to my brain, and I could think only of the quest for a horror now grown to cataclysmic stature in my imagination, a quest which the fate of Arthur Monroe had made me vow to keep silent and solitary. The scene of my excavations would alone have been enough to unnerve any ordinary man. Baleful primal trees of unholy size, age, and grotesqueness leered above me like the pillars of some hellish druidic temple, muffling the thunder, hushing the clawing wind, and admitting but little rain. Beyond the scarred trunks in the background, illumined by faint flashes of filtered lightning, rose the damp, livid stones of the deserted mansion, while somewhat nearer was the abandoned Dutch garden, whose walks and beds were polluted by a white, fungus-fetid, overnourished vegetation that never saw full daylight. Nearest of all was the graveyard, where deformed trees tossed insane branches as their roots displaced unhallowed slabs and sucked venom from what lay below. Now and then, beneath the brown pall of leaves that rotted and fested in the antediluvian forest darkness, I could trace the sinister outlines of some of those low mounds which characterized the lightning-pierced region. History had led me to this archaic grave. History, indeed, was all I had after everything else ended in mocking Satanism. I now believed that the lurking fear was no material being, but a wolf-fanged ghost that rode the midnight lightning. And I believed, because of the masses of local tradition, I had unearthed in search with Arthur Monroe that the ghost was that of Jan Martens, who died in 1762. This is why I was digging idiotically in his grave. The Martens Mansion was built in 1670 by Gerrit Martens, a wealthy New Amsterdam merchant who disliked the changing order under British rule and had constructed this magnificent domicile on a remote woodland summit whose untrodden solitude and unusual scenery pleased him. The only substantial disappointment encountered in this site was that which concerned the prevalence of violent thunderstorms in summer. When selecting the hill, and building his mansion, Mynheer Martens had laid these frequent natural outbursts to some peculiarity of the year. But in time he perceived that the locality was especially liable to such phenomena. At length, having found these storms injurious to his head, he fitted up a cellar into which he could retreat from their wildest pandemonium. Of Garrett Martens's descendants, less is known than of himself since they were all reared in hatred of the English civilization and trained to shun such of the colonists as accepted it. Their life was exceedingly secluded, and people declared that their isolation had made them heavy of speech and comprehension. In appearance, all were marked by a peculiar inherited dissimilarity of eyes, one generally being blue and the other brown. Their social contacts grew fewer and fewer, till at last, they took to intermarrying with the numerous menial class about the estate. Many of the crowded family degenerated, moved across the valley, and merged with the mongrel population which was later to produce the pitiful squatters. The rest had stuck sullenly to their ancestral mansion, 
becoming more and more clannish and taciturn, yet developing a nervous responsiveness to the frequent thunderstorms. Most of this information reached the outside world through young Jan Martens, who, from some kind of restlessness, joined the colonial army when news of the Albany Convention reached Tempest Mountain. He was the first of Garrett's descendants to see much of the world, and when he returned in 1760, after six years of campaigning, he was hated as an outsider by his father, uncles, and brothers. In spite of his dissimilar Martens eyes, no longer could he share the peculiarities and prejudices of the Martenses, while the very mountain thunderstorms failed to intoxicate him as they had before. Instead, his surroundings depressed him, and he frequently wrote to a friend in Albany of plans to leave the parental roof. In the spring of 1763, Jonathan Gifford, the Albany friend of Jan Martens, became worried by his correspondent's silence especially in view of the conditions and quarrels at the Martens mansion. Determined to visit Jan in person, he went into the mountains on horseback. His diary states that he reached Tempest Mountain on September 20, finding the mansion in great decrepitude. The sullen, odd-eyed Martenses, whose unclean animal aspect shocked him, told him in broken gutturals that Jan was dead. He had, they insisted, been struck by lightning the autumn before, now lay buried behind the neglected sunken gardens. They showed the visitor the grave, barren and devoid of markers. Something in the Martens's manner gave Gifford a feeling of repulsion and suspicion, and a week later he returned with Spade and Maddock to explore the sepulchral spot. He found what he expected. A skull crushed cruelly as if by savage blows. So returning to Albany, he openly charged the Martenses with the murder of their kinsmen. Legal evidence was lacking, but the story spread rapidly round the countryside, and from that time the Martenses were ostracized by the world. No one would deal with them, and their distant manor was shunned as an accursed place. Somehow they managed to live on independently by the product of their estate, for occasional lights glimpsed from faraway hills attested their continued presence. These lights were seen as late as 1810, but toward the last they became very infrequent. Meanwhile, there grew up about the mansion and the mountain a body of diabolic legendary. The place was avoided with double deciduousness and invested with every whispered myth tradition could supply. It remained unvisited till 1816, when the continued absence of lights was noticed by the squatters at that time, a party made investigations, finding the house deserted and partly in ruins. There were no skeletons about, so that departure rather than death was inferred. The clan seemed to have left several years before, and improvised penthouses showed how numerous it had grown prior to its migration. Its cultural level had fallen very low, as proved by decaying furniture and scattered silverware which must have been long abandoned when its owners left. But though the dreaded Martenses were gone, the fear of the haunted house continued and grew very acute when new and strange stories arose among the mountain descendants. There it stood, deserted, feared, and linked with the vengeful ghost of Jan Martens, there it still stood on the night I dug in Jan Martens's grave. I have described my protracted digging as idiotic, and such it indeed was in object and method. The coffin of Jan Martens had soon been unearthed. It now held only dust and nitre. But in my fury to exhume his ghost, I delved irrationally and clumsily down beneath where he had lain. God knows what I expected to find. I only felt that I was digging in the grave of a man whose ghost stalked by night. It is impossible to say what monstrous depth I had attained when my spade and soon my feet broke through the ground beneath. The event, under the circumstances, was tremendous, for in the existence of a subterranean space here, my mad theories had terrible confirmation. My slight fall had extinguished the lantern, but I produced an electric pocket lamp and viewed the small, horizontal tunnel which led away indefinitely in both directions. It was amply large enough for a man to wriggle through, and though no sane person would have tried at that time, 
I forgot danger, reason, and cleanliness in my single-minded fever to unearth the lurking fear. Choosing the direction toward the house, I scrambled recklessly into the narrow burrow, squirming ahead blindly and rapidly and flashing but seldom the lamp I kept before me. What language can describe the spectacle of a man lost in infinitely abysmal earth, pawing, twisting, wheezing, scrambling madly through sunken convolutions of immemorial blackness without an idea of time, safety, direction, or definite object. There is something hideous in it, but that is what I did. I did it for so long that life faded to a far memory, and I became one with the moles and grubs of nighted depths. Indeed, it was only by accident that, after interminable writhings, I jarred my forgotten electric lamp alight so that it shone eerily along the burrow of caked loam that stretched and curved ahead. I had been scrambling in this way for some time, so that my battery had burned very low when the passage suddenly inclined sharply upward, altering my mode of progress. And as I raised my glance, it was without preparation that I saw, glistening in the distance, two demonic reflections of my expiring lamp. Two reflections glowing with a baneful and unmistakable effulgence and provoking maddeningly nebulous memories. I stopped automatically, though lacking the brain to retreat. The eyes approached, yet of the thing that bore them I could distinguish only a claw. But what a claw! Then far overhead I heard a faint crashing which I recognized. It was the wild thunder of the mountain, raised to hysteric fury. I must have been crawling upward for some time so that the surface was now quite near. And as the muffled thunder cladded, those eyes still stared with vacuous viciousness. Thank God I did not then know what it was, else I should have died. But I was saved by the very thunder that had summoned it, for after a hideous wait, there burst from the unseen outside sky one of those frequent mountainward bolts whose aftermath I had noticed here and there as gashes of disturbed earth and fulgurites of various sizes. With cyclopean rage, it tore through the soil above that damnable pit, blinding and deafening me, yet not wholly reducing me to a coma. In the chaos of sliding, shifting earth, I clawed and floundered helplessly till the rain on my head steadied me and I saw that I had come to the surface in a familiar spot. A steep, unforested place on the southwest slope of the mountain. Recurrent sheet lightnings illumined the tumbled ground and the remains of the curious low hummock which had stretched down from the wooded higher slope, but there was nothing in the chaos to show my place of egress from the lethal catacomb. My brain was as great a chaos as the earth, and as a distant red glare burst on the landscape from the south, I hardly realized the horror I had been through. But when two days later the squatters told me what the red glare meant, I felt more horror than that which the mold burrow and the claw and eyes had given, more horror because of the overwhelming implications. In a hamlet twenty miles away, an orgy of fear had followed the bolt which brought me above ground, and a nameless thing had dropped from an overhanging tree into a weak-roofed cabin. It had done a deed, but the squatters had fired the cabin in frenzy before it could escape. It had been doing that deed at the very moment the earth caved in on the thing with the claw and eyes.
copyright exists on all recordings issued by Edward E. French. Any unauthorized broadcasting, public performance, copying, or re-recording of these audiobooks in any manner whatsoever will constitute an infringement of such copyright. Editing, alteration, copying, or redistribution inconsistent with copyright laws is prohibited, whether by digital, electronic, or other means. Links may be used, provided that full and clear credit is given to Edward E. French with appropriate and specific direction to the original content. Direct inquiries regarding this recording to Edward E. French at email edwardfrench06 at hotmail.com. Subscribe to the Fiction Fantastique channel, www.youtube.com forward slash French Edward 06.